All right, fellas, so this will be the last part in this little um, Black Warrior Lures uh, river fishing tips, at least for now. Last time someone had a question about hand lines. They said they don't do rod and reel, and they wanted to know about hand lines on the river. And I wanted to touch on fly fishing on the Black Warrior River, as well as uh, some target species that to target. The main target species on the Black Warrior are uh, blue catfish, channel catfish, flatheads, striped bass, basically um, hybrids, um, well, bluegill crappie, uh, and spotted bass. There are more spotted bass per square mile on the um, Black Warrior River than any other river in the state of the Union, even compared to like the Coosa River. And th you know, it's actually, there's, m there's more bass per square mile there than anywhere else in the world. So it's really a spotted bass fishery. Now, what is a spotted bass? A spotted bass is a largemouth bass, but it's almost like a hybrid breed between a largemouth bass and a smallmouth bass. If you took a largemouth and smallmouth and put them together, you'd end up with a spotted bass. That's why we say that. They're somewhat smaller than largemouth bass, somewhat, but they're bigger than smallmouth bass, but they fight like smallmouth bass. They're just as ornery as smallmouth bass, and they stay in the same sorts of waters that smallmouth bass stay in. Like, they're more in the moving water, that kind of thing. And uh, that's why a lot of guys like doing it. And the number one way that people fish for spotted bass around these parts is with live shad. They're really catch live shad and they'll put live shad and just fish off the old dams and things like that and that's what they're catching them with i mean you can you know uh as far as artificials i found that mickey fins work really really well and i think i recorded this before i just think i haven't uh, i've been using mickey fins here like so that's a mickey fin but with a spinner blade on the back i don't know if we can make sure that's in focus that's what I've been experimenting with here of late. Hand lines. Hand, you know I love hand lines. Hand lining works very well on the Black Warrior. If you really want to learn how to fish the Black Warrior methodically, slowly, methodically, a hand line with a Paternoster rig where literally the weight is at the bottom and about 18, about three feet up from that you put a hook and about three feet up from that you put a hook. I'll try to link to an article from the World Health uh, from the UN, the UN World Health Organization or whatever has a really nice pamphlet on handline fishing and I'll try to remember if you don't if I don't put it in the description below just remind me in fact just say where's the link you know to the handline fishing pamphlet I also have a book online on uh, teachable.com about handline fishing my experiences if you're interested there but Hand lining works because you will slowly and methodically over time create a mental picture of the river bottom. If you're dragging lures on the bottom or slightly tapping the bottom and you can literally feel the line in the bottom. You, can, you know when you're over a rocky bottom because it feels a certain way. You know when you're in a grassy bottom because it feels a certain way. It's kind of mushy and feels like it's getting hung up. You know if you're over a brush pile because of how it runs over the rocks and over the limbs and stuff. You know when it's gravel because it just, you can hardly feel it. It just sort of, it's like you're on Swiss cheese or something. You, it's almost like Eskimo style fishing. You're, you're going off of a tactile sense of what is here, all right? And you're just not using sonar, you're just dragging the river bottom with a single hand line and a weight on the bottom, hooks above it and bait above it, and you just make pass after pass after pass methodically. You run up, you get really close to the bank and make a pass, and then you move out about five or ten yards you make another pass and you move out from the bank another five ten yards you make a path until you get all the way across the river and you slowly and methodically you know you know mile by mile fish that river and you will have a map of the river bottom in your mind that no sonar can replace i promise you that's what's missing in modern day fishing the body of knowledge i, I in some sense i believe has shrunk because people are relying too much on sonar and not as much on the body of knowledge amassed by fishermen themselves over the years. There's no king's road to excellent fishing. You just have to fish a lot. And even people who use lots of sonar, 
they have a very similar methodical way that they they'll 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 take a pass and record everything and then sit down at the computer or sit down on their sonar at home and look at every every yard every foot every inch of that river as they flowed down through it with their side viewing sonars and things like that it's the same process they're doing it with the aid of electronics i'm doing it with a good old-fashioned hand line it doesn't really matter you have to know your waters you got to know where the structure where the weed beds start well i know where they start because i know where the rocky part ends and where it starts feeling mushy and there's weed beds because when you pull up the line, it's, it's got gunk on it. I just know where the weed beds are. I, you know, I can't, I can't tell you what they look like. I don't need to know what they look like. I just know where they are. And I know I can, okay, I can go a little bit higher in the water column and the, and the fish will come and, and I have to do trickiness. And over the weed beds, I know you're better off with a, almost like a fly fishing rig that has sinking line or lead core line. And that flying is just flowing over the, the weed beds like that and those fish will come out of those weed beds and attack the bait and, and get it and that works better over the weed beds than it does over the rocky bottom where you're just better off just dragging a a piece of weight with some hooks above it above the water and uh, above the weight and dragging along the bottom and they come out from the rocks and attack it that way as well when you're going hand lining on the black warrior use monofilament don't use braid it's braid will cut you like it's, it's like cutting bologna it'll cut you uh, thicker lines. I mean the thinnest line I use. Well, I've used eight pound test um, Hand lining, but I have special shock leaders that I've made In fact, I was tying up some shock leaders for my jug lines I'm going to experiment with uh, either this week or next so that it absorbs the shock I mean when you're hand lining you don't have the bow of the rod taking the taking the um, the brunt force of the fish hitting the line you're you're totally at the lion's mercy so you have to learn how to this is the best drag ever invented okay nothing is more sensitive than this a lot of rod and reel people don't like to hear that because they don't want to realize that their 250 dollar rod is nothing compared to this all right and you use monofilament because you need the shock absorption that stretch works for you and i even put more stretch in the line because i put uh, twisted leaders on mine. If you haven't seen that video, go check it out. It, it adds shock absorption, but does not lessen the sensitivity. 20 pound test line is what I use for the main line on my hand lines. And then I usually will go down to a uh, eight foot section of eight pound line. I just, you know, light line, small hooks, live bait are just always my default. Uh, I just don't catch that much with heavier lines and stuff and bigger baits and stuff. I don't catch as many fish and I catch a fewer variety of fish when I upsize everything. I just Carolina rig. If you're going to go hand lines, there's basically two rigs. You have the Paternoster rig, uh, weight at the bottom, hooks above it. And then you have, you can say a Carolina rig where the weights up top and the hooks are at the bottom. But instead of a Carolina rig, you're much better off using a like a sinking fly line rig. Go ahead and put 20 pound test as your backing, right? 20 pound monofilament as your backing. And then you put a hundred feet of, of weighted fly line. Just, you can get on AliExpress, type in weighted fly line, buy some seven weight weighted fly line or something like that. Uh, it, it sinks at like six inches per second, or you can buy lead core line. I'm, but I'm, I'm paranoid about lead. I just don't like using lead. I'm just paranoid about it because it's poisonous to the human body. That kind of thing's toxic. Just don't be eaten by any sausages while you've got your hand on that lead core line. Um, uh, fly line is going to be the most comfortable to your hand. And especially if it's a weight forward sinking fly line, all that weight is forward. There's more weight toward the end of the line than there is toward the middle of the back of the line. That's going to get more weight down into the water column and go down, you know. So, and at the end of that, I would put maybe a three foot long, one of my shock leaders, and then another couple of feet long of eight pound test line. And that will just flow in the water very naturally. Very na It's the most natural presentation of all time. My Paternoster rig is more accurate in terms of depth, but in terms of natural presentation, nothing beats that natural flow of that line in the water. All right? 
think about how if you've seen in the river a leaf that's down in the water and how it just naturally flows and undulates and rises and falls and flips over that's exactly what happens when you're using fly line and lead core line it's way more natural and I catch more fish with it and that's why I ordered me some seven weight fly line I'll put one on my fly rod Phillips and six seven weight and I'll probably rig up one of my hand lines with it um, and and go from there so that's what you want to concentrate on with hand lines now as far as fly fishing on the uh, black warrior river you can do it i mean because i'm using the same rig with my hand lines that i would use with a fly line <laughs> there's, there's no difference there's no difference and you got to realize i don't cast i just troll and drift now where the fly rod will especially if you had floating lines and in in long leaders and all that where it works best is during the mayfly hatch if you can if you can just get on that river daily during the spring in may and june and find where the mayflies are because they hatch by the millions and there's like a couple of days where there's just millions of these mayflies and they're just dropping in the water it doesn't matter what the moon is doing or anything if that mayfly hatch is happening those fish are feeding period and you can just cast anything off into the bank and as it slowly sinks, it doesn't even have to sink, they'll just hit it. You could put anything on there, it doesn't matter. You could put a, it doesn't matter. You can put live bait, you can put um, artificials, you can use some of my amp flies, you can make your, tie your own spider patterns, whatever you want to do, it, they'll bite, they'll hit it. They'll just hit it because it simulates those, may, all those millions of mayflies are just hitting in the water. It's like the ultimate chum. It's the ultimate, ultimate, most ultimate chum that you've ever seen. But it only happens a couple of days a year. So you got to hit it just right. If you don't, you just miss it. it you can't wait till tomorrow because they'll all be gone. That's why I'm all in favor of using things like chum to simulate those sorts of things and using things like chum to gather the fish to you or bring them into an area or things like trolling to, to, to find the fish. Now, the way I would fish the Black Warrior River, the section of the river I'm talking about are the big riverine lakes that are dammed up and used for barge traffic like that. I would fish it two ways. I would, if I were fly fishing, I'd have two fly rods, both seven weight. I wouldn't go lighter than seven weight because you're always going to end up catching a bass or a catfish. And, you know, if you're my, uh, there was a crappie fisherman friend who, uh, he, I think he sees me fishing below the, the dam there a lot. And he was just out crappie fishing in the main channel. He's just fishing crappie rods, six pound test line hooked into like a 20 pound, it was like about, about a 25 pound flathead. You know, you don't catch flathead all that often. And it took him 20 minutes to wrestle the cat, that, that flathead in. And you know, he did a six pound line. So why do I need 20 and 30 pound line? Okay, assuming that he doesn't get under a rock or tie up around a log, the channel where we fish is just like, just if you've seen movies like River Runs Through It, that's exactly what the river bottom is like where I live. It's just been dammed up and it's just really deep. So if I'm going to fly fish, I'm going to have two fly rods, both seven weights. If it's if I'm looking for a general all around fly rod, it's going to be a seven weight. If it's specific to stripe fishing or cat or catfish or spotted bass, I'm just going to go with a nine weight and I'm going to be done with it. If it's for trophy catfish, I'm just going to go like uh, 12 weight or something, right? You know, well, well, maybe not 12, but definitely a 10 weight. Uh, for general all-around fly fishing, I believe a 7 weight is the best rod. And I would get one would be a completely floating fly line. Floating fly line, um, long, uh, I, I, tie my, I tie my own leaders twisted leaders, not knotted tapered leaders, but twisted leaders. It gets the same thing and they're way more limp and way easier to, you can tie them at speed on the river. And, uh, you know, I'd make the leader, if, the, if I have an eight foot rod, I'd probably make a seven foot leader, right? So something like that. And um, that'd be floating line. I'd probably be, I'd probably put two hooks on it, one at the bottom, one about 18 inches up. So you have a uh, um, a tandem type rig. That's my, that, it's a, exactly the same rig I use on my jug lines. It, it, there's, there's no difference. There, it's just smaller and I'm using flies instead of salted bluegill with big honking circle hooks. There, there's no difference guys. There's absolutely no difference. I hope I'm in focus. Casting more in toward the bank and sort of stripping back your traditional style. But I would also have a second fly rod, seven weight with uh, 
full sinking fly line that I am just literally just dragging a hundred feet of, uh, of line behind the boat as I'm drifting down the river casting into the bank. So you've got two things going on, right? Just because it's fly fishing doesn't mean you, it, it, people have this idea, oh, fly fishing means this, or it means this. It has to be this, and it can't look like anything else. When in fact you have an entire reservoir of knowledge that you can apply to this, right? There's no difference between my jug lines, my hand lines, my spinning gear, my fly rod. There's no difference. They're all the same. They're just a different method of delivery. The actual rig itself is exactly the same. The same shock leaders, the same knots, the same, uh, you know, I'm just using different hooks, different size hooks, different size baits, different size lines for different type fish. Other than that, the rigs are exactly the same and the fish don't know that I'm fishing fly rods or hand lines or spinning gear or jug line. They don't know. They don't know, guys, and you have to take that in consideration. Once you learn that, it doesn't really matter what your method of delivery is, whether you're trolling and pulling line behind the boat or you're casting and retrieving. The fish don't know. And you're going to catch something. You can't put that much bait in the water over a long enough period of time, over a long enough distance on the river without catching something. If you're not catching anything, what that means is the fish aren't feeding or there's no fish at that section of the river where you were fishing, just period. And so, um, but anyway, uh, that's about, that's gonna wrap it up, I think, for this little series, little three-part series on Black Warrior River fishing tips. If I have more uh, thoughts on this, I'm always experimenting, and I may just need to come back around to this maybe once a year, as I've taken a whole nother year to experiment with ideas and try new things and I could make add, add more to the list as the years go on because I've learned a lot over the since 2007 and a lot of it is not your conventional stuff you know, right? and that's one of the main reasons I started this channel was because when I was looking for information on this I just couldn't find anything I just had to get out here and experiment and trial and error so I want to help save people some time there's lots of creeks on the Black Warrior River and someone said that you can get back into these creeks depending on times of the year fishing the creek mouths all the way but I've never had all that much luck fishing the creeks uh, I've just never I've, I've I think because of the way I fish and I don't like casting and I love drifting and trolling the big water is just easier for me to fish that's one of the reasons why I want to start that's why I've been doing the River Explorer series so we can explore some of these creeks to uh, scout out future fishing spots and so um, I tell you what if you like these videos rate hit the thumbs up hit the subscribe button hit the little bell so you'll be notified when I have more videos to come out. Uh, if you would like to support what I'm doing, check out what we have over at the BlackWarriorLures.com uh, website. And um, I will talk to you guys later. See you.